There's not one guy, one person in the history of this program that's bigger than the program. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. Ooh, what's up and welcome into episode number 47 of the Program Guys Podcast. My name is Mason Prince, joined to you as always by Mark Hall, Matt Gann, Patrick Kurtzberger, no Ryan Tyson this week. Today is Wednesday, November 30th. Be sure to like, subscribe on our YouTube channel. We just hit 1,200 subs. Let's see if we can hit 1,300, my people. Keep on liking and subscribing. It costs you $0 to subscribe to the channel. It helps us out more than you know. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Program Guys with a Z. Instagram, Program Guys with a Z. Our Facebook page, Program Guys Podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts, that's where you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. However you get it, the Oklahoma Sooners are in a bye week this week. It's conference championship week. So the Sooners incorrect. Mark, Mark doesn't Our like the season term. is over. Mark doesn't it's like not the term about bye week. week. It's not about bye week. Our season's over. Well, yeah, but I mean we have a bowl game. So we the bowl, bowl game right. the, the bowl game is eventually. We don't know when that'll happen after the conference championship games this weekend, I believe, is when they decide. Um Yeah, I think we'll know Monday. I'm pretty sure the selection is Monday and then everything yeah. happens around the playoff. Yeah. Pat. But I know for some some futures that I had placed that and that I had to pay up on. Yeah. That yeah. The season. Yeah. Though. It yeah. looks like it looks like we're predicted to go to the Big Ten uh, to play a Big Ten team. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Have we're you even get there. looked we'll at get the there. outline? Patrick, Patrick, Patrick what I do you, all this work? What no. is your thought? Pat, what is your thought on the game from Saturday? You weren't in our post game pod. Wanted to get your quick overall thoughts of the game in and of itself, and where OU sits at six and six right now. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mason, because I wasn't able to vent to to you guys, and it's really we been, need it. Honestly, yeah, you we need needed it. it. You need it. But like you said, like you know, Katie said you were kind of emotionless while watching it with her. Becca looked at me during the game and was like, "You're handling yourself very well," and I was just like, "I'm done." I'm done with this team. Like, I don't understand how you do not pull off a win with everything that we had going for us in that game. It doesn't make sense to me. My biggest issue is the regression that's taken place throughout the season. There's ups and downs, but there's a lot of regression. I had always felt like if anything going into the season, we would have a similar season to what else you or Notre Dame had, even with Notre Dame losing this past weekend. That's how I felt our season would go. And we were never able to turn it around. And that's just like the most disappointing thing to me. And something that our coaches need to have an answer for moving forward. I feel like that's a fair point that I don't think we brought up during the postgame pod. At what point or what part of this team can you say is better than it was week one or week zero? What, like, how is this team the running improved? back room? Okay. That's it. Well, the offensive line probably got a lot better. But, yep, that's kind of, another one. I think they kind of go okay. hand in hand a little bit. Yeah. That's All about right. it. I think we're bleeding into another fun little episode we're doing though. Yeah, that'll be that'll yeah. be in the future. Um so I, I thought that was an interesting point, Patrick. That that's all. But yeah. Um Oklahoma, six and six. They uh they're on to seeing who's going to enter the transfer portal now. Transfer portal now and seeing who stays, seeing who goes, and finishing strong in a recruiting process that ends in a couple weeks. Um, I, I don't know exactly the date for National Signing Day, but it's creeping up rather quickly. Quickly. And, it's like the 14th and, or the 17th yeah, I think or something. It's the second week of December, um, second full week. Uh, I'm not. 100% sure. But let's let's go ahead and just jump into a little OU news real quick. Dylan Gabriel named co-offensive player of the week and co-newcomer of the week for the Big 12 for this past week. Six touchdown performance. He, he deserves that. Effort. In a losing effort. Uh, he played very well. We said it on the postgame pod. Also, if you commented on the postgame pod, appreciate you very much. We appreciate that. Postgame pod uh, had a lot of viewers, had a lot of uh, people comment. We appreciate that as always. Um, anything on the Dylan Gabriel front, guys? That you find interesting with with that? No, he deserved it I mean, for this week. He had a great. He did. Week. Yeah, just just really great game out of him. Yeah, he played. He played well. I liked what he. I liked what I saw. Bowl predictions, Patrick. This is what we were getting at. Some bowl predictions <laughs> for the Oklahoma Sooners. Guaranteed rate bowl 
in Phoenix on December 27th against Wisconsin or Maryland. That is according to ESPN Action Network and CBS Sports. Shout out to Mark or Matt, whoever put this in here. Shout out. Thank you, Mark. Yahoo Sports, Sporting News, and Pro Football Network have the Sooners going to the AutoZone Liberty Bowl in Memphis. That is on December 28th, possibly against Ole Miss or Arkansas. That would be a fun game. I'd enjoy that. Um, Personally, as growing up as an Arkansas fan, my father being the massive Arkansas fan that he is. Also, if we got to play Ole Miss, seeing them play against Lane Kiffin and Jeff Levy's old team, that'd be a lot of fun as well. And then USA Today, 24-7 Sports, Athlon Sports has OU in the Texas Bowl in Houston on December 28th against either Arkansas or Missouri. And the Athletic has OU in the Cheez-It Bowl in Orlando on December 29th against Florida State. Anything stick out to you guys about those bowls? I feel like that's what we should expect is one of those four. So I think it's actually kind of cool that you know, you have a, a pretty rough season and we're playing for a winning record. I mean, that sucks. But you look up and everyone on the list is a name in yeah. the Big Ten or the SEC or Florida State. I mean, Maryland, you know, whatever. But Ole Miss, Arkansas, I guess Missouri kind of sucks too. Whatever. But you know what I mean? Ole Miss, Arkansas not... are cool. Yeah, Ole Miss, Arkansas are cool. Shout out to the SEC. Ready to be there. I think we should all pick what our favorite bowl to be picked to go to would be. Mine would be the Texas Bowl because I think we could get that Arkansas matchup and possibly go to it because I have Houston ties. So yeah. that would be a lot of fun for me. I think that we would get a good showing in that game. You would get actual fans who live in Houston for any of the teams that are there and uh, make NRG a pretty fun environment. I like the I like the idea of the Cheez It Bowl, just because getting to play against an ACC opponent, an opponent that you're not going to see very often, especially a Florida State. Last time we saw Florida State was, you know, 2013, 2012, around there in Tallahassee. So I think it'd be fun to play Florida State in the Cheez It Bowl. Orlando's always a fun time. I know it'd be hard to like go to and get fans to travel to, but but Orlando's a cool city. It'd be warm. Wouldn't have to worry about it being cold like like the Liberty Bowl would be. Me- Memphis in December is not a fun time. I'm telling you right now, it's not. It You don't want to go to the Liberty Bowl. You think it's the South, and like it kind of is, but it's it, also kind of not. Yeah. yeah. It's cold in, yeah. in Tennessee in December. It is. Matt? Yeah, I'll say the Phoenix Bowl. I've been there a couple times. Obviously lived there for a little bit too. So it's a very fun place. Wisconsin would be a really good team, a really good school to to play against. And hey, even Maryland, you know, to his brother, right? He's still there, I think. That's is that yeah. Okay, so, you know, to his brother, have some ties. Mason, obviously, with your Miami Dolphins, uh, the way they're playing with two at the helm. So, two big names. Again, we don't really play a lot of Big Ten schools that often, but I think Phoenix would be a pretty cool place. I'm just excited to see where the boys, uh, where we get tickets in a hotel, too. So, I'll see you guys there. If Tua told me I had to root for Maryland, I'd root for Maryland. I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> okay. Okay. Go, uh, go I just wanted to see Mark's reaction. That's all I, I wanted. So on this one, I hope we don't play Wisconsin because no one on our team can tackle Braylon Allen. <laughs> Ain't no way. Ain't no way. That wouldn't that wouldn't be fun. It, Patrick, goes, it goes so bad. I agree with Mason on this. Florida State would be the coolest, but I would like us to see Again, I like to see us against Ole Miss and Levy playing against Lane to see if Lane's like, I know every single player calling, you're not going to beat me, and to see if you actually do that. Or it, if Levy is an individual guy and was the one calling the plays at Ole Miss and Lane doesn't know his mind. It'd be fun to see. I almost just want to see OU play Ole Miss just to purge any defensive awfulness out of this team. Like, have that Ole Miss team come in and literally try to score 70 points. And see if they can do it. And see if we can keep pace. Because D- Ole Miss's defense isn't great either. Like, we could put up some points as well. So, I, it, I'd be, it'd be fun just to see a shootout like that, in my mind. So, that'd be yeah. that'd be a lot of fun. Um, any, anything else on the bowl front before we move on? I think for me, it'll be interesting to see which players opt out, which players actually decide to play in the bowl game. Because, obviously, the transfer portal is a bigger deal now. So, people don't want to play in the bowl game because they want to avoid injuries or 
possibly go into the draft. So it will be interesting to see in the next few weeks of uh, which players will actually decide to opt in. I know that's a big thing that BV talked about was committing to your team and committing to playing the full season, which obviously includes the bowl game. At, excuse me, I know Mark mentioned earlier, but we are fighting for a winning season, and we've had a winning season. I think the record right now for us – it's like back in 1980, so that's something that we're also fighting for as well is not breaking that streak of 28-plus years or something. So definitely a big deal, but it'd be interesting to see who plays. Yep. In the post-game press conference, Marvin Mims and C.J. Colden both said that they planned on playing. Now, that's in the heat of battle after a tough loss, so you know maybe don't hold them to that if they change their mind. But two guys that it'd be great to see play. Um I imagine Eric Gray sits out. I imagine Anton Harrison sits out. I Wanya Morris went left Texas Tech game with an injury. He's not playing. Why would he? Uh, it'll be interesting to see if any of those guys make a different decision. Uh, you know, Braden Willis. Yeah. What's Braden Willis do? I He's, think Braden plays. I think he plays. I think he does too, but he, this was the first year he doesn't get hurt. And it would be a real shame if something were to happen in a bowl game that could keep him from getting drafted or something. That's all. I, I can agree with that. Speaking of some exits, let's let's recap just a little bit of the fallout after the Texas Tech game and it being kind of transfer portal season. Theo Weiss reportedly hitting the transfer portal. He That is yet to be like confirmed by anything I've seen, especially from Theo Weiss. So he's had some scheduled tweets go out, which people are like kind of reading into. But I mean... I, He's, he was scheduled to have those go out. I think that's not anything here nor there, but that's something he copied and pasted because he was, you know, yeah. told to. Yeah. Um, I think, I think Theo, I, I've thought about this a lot. And if Theo did leave, I wouldn't be upset with him. I'd, I obviously would like for him to stay, but the fact that he would be a graduate transfer and he'd have two years of eligibility somewhere else. And he would have his degree from Oklahoma. I feel like at that point he's fulfilled his obligation to the University of Oklahoma. I'd love for him to stay, but I'm not going to be mad at him if he if he leaves. Like I won't I won't be pissed at him. He he's fulfilled his obligation. He got his degree, played football for OU for three years, four years, whatever it was, and now he's moving on. Patrick, you're shaking your head. I don't know. I I I guess I'd be a little upset. And I was shaking my head because I was thinking about how he was a captain. And then I was get, thinking about how our whole captain thing plays out. And then I got upset with that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> but fair. My thing, my thing on Theo is I, I y'all saw Caleb Williams tweet at him a few weeks ago. I think USC gets him if they want him. See, but here's my thing with that, man. Like those receivers that came in, Jaden Hazelwood, Trajan Bridges, and Theo Weiss, they didn't have a good relationship with Lincoln Riley. Yeah, that's, they that's didn't a good point. have that. Jaden went to Arkansas after Lincoln left to USC. If anyone would have gone, it would have been Jaden. And Jaden was like, I don't want nothing to do with you. So I don't think those receivers had a, a good enough relationship to go to USC and be with Lincoln like that. I just don't. I don't know. For transparency, the report comes from a man named Mike Roach at Mike Roach 247. He's a recruiting editor at Horns 247. So, I mean, reputable. He's a guy. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll just have to see on that. I really love that in the post game, I went hard for uh, Theo Weiss quote about culture. And the mm -hmm. next day, this tweet comes out about Theo leaving. Um, really hope that he sticks around, but he also... I don't think necessarily owes anything to the guys on the roster right now that, you know, any other guy who's graduated and wants to look around at their options does either. He was interviewed by the strengthening Oklahoma guys, Dusty and Gabe, I think today. And uh, they asked him what he would look for, or what he would use when he was evaluating a, uh, a move and it was opportunities and I don't know if those are going to be there here. I just don't know. I don't know what they're looking for. Theo didn't get that many this year, right? There weren't enough balls to go around for him with everyone else. I guess we'll see. Hope he stays. Matt. 
Yeah, my thoughts on it are that we could be possibly losing our three starting wide receivers, Drake Stoops, Marvin Mims, and Theo Weiss. That's really what I, my thought process is. Obviously, Marvin possibly going to the draft, Drake Stoops being his senior year. He does have one year of eligibility left, so he could possibly come back. But Theo would definitely be a big loss losing those three guys. He did enter the transfer portal last summer, if we remember correctly. It ended up opting to come back to OU, so it will be interesting to see if there were offers that he had. He just decided to decline, or maybe he reaches out to maybe some of those schools that he talked to last year. So really interesting to see other than just Theo, I've heard some rumors about Stutzman possibly going as well. So it's just going to be interesting to see who else decides to maybe test out the waters and try something different or goes from there. Do we, do we know Brent Venable's policy on entering the portal? Can you come back once you enter? I mean, I'm sure you can because well, Theo did. Theo did so well, sure that, you- that was last year though. I think he was giving everyone kind of, you know, uh, the option to because he was new. I don't know if he's going to do that after this year. I have no idea. I would get the sense that a guy like Theo Weiss would get the ability to come back. I'm not sure there has to be a set policy for every decision. Yeah, just with the whole recruiting flip policy or the recruitment policy, it would be a similar policy for the transfer portal. Right. I, I, yeah. I just don't know. I, I, I would imagine I see it a little different when you've contributed to the team and been a leader sure. and yeah. obviously a captain. Yeah. Also, sophomore defensive back Jordan Mukes is has entered the transfer portal. He is leaving OU. Um, I wish I wish him the best. Uh, there was a strong quote from Marvin Mims after the Texas Tech game about leadership and how it was difficult for some of the leaders on the team to transition into what was expected of them as leaders and as football players under Brent Venables. And I think this is just one of those examples of a guy who isn't just just not a fit, you know? And that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's nothing against Jordan. That's nothing against Brent. Just sometimes when a new coach comes in and the culture changes as much as it does, you you try to stick it out and you try to make it fit and it just doesn't work. So I wish Jordan the best uh, wherever he goes. Yeah, a guy like that sticking around all year. He hasn't played a snap in 2022, but he stayed even when the coaching change happened. You know, best of luck to him. It didn't work out here, but hopefully it works out somewhere else. I remember being excited when Oklahoma signed Jordan and the physical traits are there. So hopefully he lands on his feet somewhere that's not in the Big 12 or the SEC and we can root for him all the way. Right. Some other news. Dylan Gabriel said after the Texas Tech game that he was unsure if he will stay at OU. Uh, I think we kind of touched on this in the post game pod. So cool. just, just a little update is that Jeff Levy thinks that he's going to stay. So that's, I guess the updated news in that that's, I don't really have anything other to say to say about it. Cause I spoke on it in the post game. Anybody else? Yeah. That's what Levy said at, during his post game press conference. I see DG staying. I don't think he's good enough to go in the league with a high draft pick right now. I think maybe another year helps him there. I also think he's just comfortable at OU with Levy. And trust Lubby. I always I obviously don't see him transferring. Okay. Hudson Card is leaving the University of Texas. He's transferring away from Texas. Just some other news that might be important. Also be on the lookout for Quinn Ewers to enter the transfer portal next year because he ain't gonna stay with Arch Manning. Hudson Card is among like six or seven guys from Texas that went ahead and entered, or it was reported that they were entering the portal today. I'm not familiar with all of their games, but if Dylan decides he wants to go to the NFL or something like that, hey, Hudson, come up yeah. north, man. Why, Why not? not? Let's not figure bad. it out. It'd be an opening. He was a top 40 recruit his year. That's, you know, just because yeah. just because Quinn Ewers decided to come to town does not make Hudson Card a bad quarterback. No. No, no, no. Also, Mason, to your other point, I think Quinn's going to beat out Manning. I mean, I'm sure he will next year, but I mean, after that. I think I think they're going to be a, either Arch is going to play. They aren't giving him all that NIL money to just sit on the bench. That's true. They're, they're not. He He's going to play. And if it's not next year, then it's the year after that. So where does that leave Quinn Ewers? You know what I mean? Because he was a, technically like a freshman this year. Wasn't yep. that right? 
Yeah. So like he before has went all, his senior year of yeah. high school to join OSU early last year. Yeah, he has all of the eligibility in the world. And yeah, he'll he'll be out of there. Some recruiting news. Four star defensive lineman David Lacey from the 2019 class. He was he played for Notre Dame. He is coming to OU. He committed, I should say. He had he committed to OU. He's 6'2, 285. Good size. It's what you want to see in terms of your defensive lineman. Yeah. Two years of eligibility. Two years of eligibility. I I think that's exciting. We we need big humans. There's there's so many. I watched that Ohio State and Michigan game, and guys, I don't know if you felt the same way, but I watched that game and I'm like, man, these teams dwarf OU. Like everyone just looks so much like physically more gifted and just bigger, and that was upsetting. Like seeing Ohio State's receivers catch passes and then watching. Marvin Mims and Drake Stoops and respectfully Theo Weiss. He's he's got good size, but he's skinny. He's not he's not a strong looking dude. I just I don't know, man. I feel like this is good size. That's all I'm saying. I'm yeah. just happy to see some more size. And no, I don't think it's on Schmitty either. I want to clarify. I, no. I don't think it's on Schmitty. Not as of now. No. Right, not as of now. We gotta get we guys have to have the possibility of actually being in the program for a year or two before we start commenting on their strength. Yeah. yeah. I uh um super sorry, David Lacey. Depth up front is always good. Depth up front is I mean, like it's massive. Give, give Todd Bates two years with a guy who already knows how to play at an upper tier level. Oh. It, this I don't know a lot about David Lacey. I can't act like I do, but he played at Notre Dame. He wasn't just a bench guy that is hoping to get a new opportunity. This is something different. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully he can be a real contributor day one. Matt. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how BB utilizes the transfer portal. Obviously this is a good start, but I know he said last year that, you know, this first year coming in, this was going to be the real year to utilize the transfer portal to bring depth in and really just wanted to bring in his own guys, develop just like he did at Clemson. So it'll be interesting to see how often he goes after some of these guys, especially a lot of the A&M guys are going into the portal after their debacle of a season. And obviously Luke Fickle leaving Cincinnati. They got some players that are entering the transfer portal. So I wonder how aggressive BV will be because a lot of these guys were recruited by Oklahoma originally and had offers. So we really interested to see how BV goes about this kind of off season period. Brent did say that they weren't going to be looking for a quarterback in the portal, but that's kind of all he elaborated on. He didn't mention any other position that they weren't looking for. So I think you're right, Matt. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah. Go ahead. I, Hey, if we're just still on this, I think, I think we are going to use the portal. I don't be surprised to see us add 12, 15 guys. We're going to have people. They got to have depth. There is know? senior turnover. Yeah. We don't have classes, you know, bringing up the back end. That number that 16 guys in Lincoln Riley's last recruiting class, we just don't have bodies. Yeah. So, yeah, they expect to see guys from the portal join this team. They, I don't think Brent has a choice. I'm I'm super concerned about our offensive depth going into next year. And I feel like we have to hit the portal. Like, are we going to rely on Farouk and Barnes next year as our number one guys? Uh, that's that's scary to me. They're young. I can't well, Farouk will be a junior. Okay. He could be ready for it. Yeah. he. I think he's ready for number one, but who's after Farouk? I yeah. just go back. Who's like at a level. I just like go back level. to not big, strong, physical dude. I don't. I'm just scared of Farouk being that number one guy. On and the receiver point, too, we haven't had a receiver coach for all year, for yeah. an entire season. And it's not yeah. the Damian Washington's fault, but no. it, you, that you Mark clearly see only the guys who were good at the beginning of the year were guys able to play. Jaden yeah. Gibson didn't develop. Nick no. Anderson never saw the field. Gavin Freeman was a trick play guy. All of our young guys, it, Jaleel Farouk is just a sweep dude now. Yeah. How are we just now mentioning that? Like, yeah. I duh, know. Duh. Yeah. Marvin Marvin Mims in that interview also kind of mentioned LaDamian Washington, not in a, like a bad way, 
just kind of like how they handled the whole Kale Gundy situation and how they worked through it. You kind of got the feeling from, from what Marvin said that it was kind of, they felt that it was a, that it was a stopgap and it's not going to be what happens in the long run. So hopefully they keep with Damien on staff. Maybe he has gotten this taste for a lead receiver coach job and, wants to go somewhere else and be the lead receiver coach. What I don't know yet. That's just speculation. So we'll, we'll find out. Um, other recruiting news is Sam Spiegelman of on three. He increases the probability of David stone committing to Oklahoma six, four, 270 pound defensive lineman Mark. Oh, I just, we are thirsty and down bad. If we're covering a, a I think it went up like 15%. That we're still covering it's news, baby. I'm I want news. that guy. We don't have to go deep into it, but also Anthony Evans, he flipped his commitment from OU to Georgia. If you remember correctly, that was the wide receiver who went and visited Georgia because his mom wanted to see Georgia. And yeah, yeah I she guess saw, I she guess, had a good time. Uh, I guess it I guess she really liked it. So <sighs> yeah. I mean that one hurts. How can you not? You when you have a guy go into Athens and talk to Kirby Smart, Kirby Smart can sell a catch a popsicle to a woman wearing white gloves. You never want that to happen. That's why Brent has the policy about if you're committed, you don't take official visits elsewhere because stuff like this can happen. Because yeah. newsflash, Kirby Smart can recruit his ass off and he's a damn good football coach and has a damn good program. That, like you don't want your four star receiver going there to take a visit, and this is this is the kind of stuff that happens, man. Even if it was just his mom going to see what Georgia is like or wanted to see Athens, like I mean, whatever that may be true, but anything can happen at that point. Only bad things happen at that point. Nothing good can happen, and you yeah, can't stop time. it all. So. Yeah. Send someone with them and get a seat in the stands. I don't know. <laughs> I I next time a recruit is committed <laughs> and wants to go kick it with Kirby Smart. I don't. think the guard I think my guard's gonna be up a little, <laughs> yeah. a little bit. You know, oh, yeah. I was like, you know, yeah, I I love my mom too. <laughs> and now yeah. it's like of course he was going to do that. Yeah. Hi, I'm a not not that this is anything you haven't, but say a massive defensive lineman who's committed to you is like, yeah, no, Nick Saban said he just wants to have me down for a nice cold Coca Cola. <laughs> no, the answer is no. No, don't Can't let go. You do it. Can't let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> like he'll, I, he'll no go one, to Alabama. No he one will. closes like Saban and Smart, man. Dude, it's it's just they're crazy. not still at the bar at two a.m. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Matt? Yeah, I mean, just people are testing BV's policy, so it'll be interesting to see how he handles it moving forward. I know I keep saying it'll be interesting how he handles all these things, but it's truly what he has to do, especially after the season that he had and what we brought him in for, and this will truly be his first full year of offseason to deal see, with these types of things. So we'll... I get what you're saying, Matt, but see, I feel like we've had this conversation before. His policies are being tested, but to me, they aren't really being tested because he flat out said, if you're committed and you go somewhere else, that gives me the green light to go recruit other people. So he's not just sitting pat. You know what I mean? Like, he's not just like, oh, well, crap, we lost that guy. Like, as soon as that guy goes on another visit, as soon as that guy goes on another visit, they're recruiting another wide receiver. He doesn't even have to flip his commitment before they're doing that. That's his policy. So... I get where you're coming from, but I think that's, I think we're missing. Some people are missing the point of what Brent's policy actually is. He's not like, Hey, if you're committed, like I'm not recruiting anyone else. No. Like as soon as you're committed and you go somewhere else, Brent's on the phone with somebody who, with the next person on his list. I think that's the way that he meant it. And I, that that's just me though. No, yeah. for sure. I think I that, I think that provides a lot of clarification, and and that's kind of what I was getting at. But yeah. now it's now we're at the point of okay, if we are losing these guys like a Colton Basket, like an Anthony Evans, 
who is he going after to replace right with these guys? Because these guys are top tier talent in their recruiting classes. So I think it's more of just okay, who is he now going after? Who are we signing? So that's what I'm trying to see more of is who's going to come in place for some I get of those you. guys. I didn't mean to come at you if I did. Matt. No, you're good. Uh, I think okay, that, all right. That provides I, some good transparency. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm we going to come at you, Matt. Yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've learned that the easiest thing to do is just accept Mason's interpretation and try not to get beat up about it when kids are kids. We already got a replacement for Colton Bassett, or we're close to, right? Yeah, Taylor uh, Wein, Taylor right. Wine, Taylor right. Wine, and uh, to my knowledge, Cecilia Kana is still in play, but I I haven't seen anything in a minute on him. Yeah, I haven't either. Uh, anybody have a commenter of the week? Yeah, I have one. I was looking. Go ahead, up. Mark. Yeah, so this week's is going to go to our guy Derek Hunter. Derek Hunter. Shout out Derek. Thanks for coming. Shout out Derek. Ted Roof is a career mercenary. He is the fall guy for the lack of talent on years one and half of year two. Bates will be DC once their talent is on campus and semi developed. Roof took job understanding he was a placeholder for Bates. See, I don't know if that was like necessarily said out loud. But you look at the concurrent hires of Ted Roof, old as dirt, yeah, co-DC, and Todd Bates, never been one before, kind of on the younger side, co-DC. You've got kind of a, a on his way out and an on his way up. So I think our guy Derek makes a great point. I Derek Hunter, subscribed. Derek, you opened my eyes, honestly. Yeah. You opened my eyes with that right there because that's something that I didn't really think about. So shout out to Derek Hunter. Thank you for the comment. As always, if you're watching this video right now on our YouTube channel, please comment down below. We read every single comment that you guys leave. We appreciate it. We try to respond to a good amount of them. Sometimes there's a lot of them, so it's hard, but we read all of them. We appreciate the interaction as always, and be sure to uh, like, subscribe to the channel if you're watching. Matt, do you have anything to add? You look like you want to hop in. Nope. Okay. So... College football playoff, top four. A little update. Just released on Tuesday night. This is kind of a live reaction for the boys right here because this just happened. We're recording this pod on a Tuesday night. Georgia stays number one. Michigan, number two after that thumping of Ohio State. TCU, in turn, moves up to number three. USC in there at number four. Ohio State, number five. Alabama at six. Interesting. Um, I don't know what I really expected. I feel like you had no other choice but to move USC into four at this point. You you can't you can't deny that they've beaten some quality teams, I guess, especially after the win against Notre Dame. Um, they're gonna have the Heisman winning quarterback that has to come into account as well. Um Georgia I'm being sorry, one. I think we I think we say it. They're the they're in the Oklahoma spot. He's copied and pasted the Oklahoma experience in the West Coast. They've got the Heisman winning quarterback. They were at five with a position to drop into four the moment someone messed up. It's exactly what we've seen forever and ever and ever. And they're going to be two touchdown dogs to Georgia, and that's going to be fun. Yeah, and I can't wait for people to not care that they lost to in the in the playoff. Because Lincoln Riley's playoff losses won't count at USC. They'll only count at OU. That'll be fun. Program's close. Yeah. I, th- yeah. I mean, this is his formula to get in, and it works for him, and I hate it. Who do you guys because... like in that top four right now? I'm sorry, Patrick. I apologize. No, I'm just saying, like, the, that's his formula to get in, but, it, I mean, he'll never, like, if that's your only formula, you'll never win. I agree. It's We've just... seen it before. We've been here. Yeah. People like are Mark being said. bamboozled. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. let it happen to you. Yeah. Like, I loved going, but I didn't like losing by a, a crazy amount every single time, except for once. Yeah. Bro, that first game, that Georgia USC game, if that's what 1 4 is, is slated to be played in Atlanta. That's a home game for the dogs. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're going to send Alex Grinch's wild, wacky defense full of tiny, fast people up against Georgia and the, those offensive linemen. Yeah, in Atlanta, bro, better than been on the other side too. Defensive linemen, all they did was reload with another set of first round picks along the yeah. front seven. Caleb, this is the best defense you've ever played. Good luck, champ. 
Let's see how good Jordan Addison and Mario Williams really are. Matt, say TCU wins this weekend. Are they, do they have a shot to at least make a national title game? In your eyes, do you think they could beat that Michigan team right now? It's hard to say. Um, I think the way Michigan played against Ohio State in the shoe was really impressive to me. I think that's probably the best win of the college football season. So if they had to go that. against if they had to go play against Georgia or Michigan and winning one of those games, I don't think they're beating in either one of those teams. If they somehow get switched around, they play USC, that would probably be their best bet to get in the national championship. I think Georgia and Michigan are clearly on another level, especially on the defensive side of the ball. We've seen Georgia be a little sporadic and kind of keep teams around in the first half, just like they did with Georgia Tech last week in the last few weeks, but they do come alive in the second half. But, yeah, TCU, I think, would really only have a chance if they ended up playing SC at some point, if that was the case. So I think what the committee is telling us right here, no matter what Georgia does, Georgia's in. No matter what they do, they're in. No matter what Michigan does, they're in. And TCU has to win. TCU has to win to be in. Because if they're not, they're going to slide Ohio State in there, no problem. And don't look now, but Alabama's alive. A two-loss Alabama team has a reasonable shot at getting to the playoff. And it's, that... Go ahead. No, no it pisses ahead. me off. You know who I knew beat them and only has one loss? Tennessee. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, but you don't have a quarterback now, Patrick. I understand that Hendon's hurt, but they also hung like 50 last weekend. And Milton is like a veteran quarterback as well. He's not so, good, like good, but he is a veteran quarterback. It still this, doesn't make sense. This week after the Michigan-Ohio State game, one team received more bets and money in Vegas to win the national championship than any other, and it's Ohio State. Because they're looking at this top five like I am, and they're listening to what Mason said. And I'm thinking, okay, Georgia's in no matter what, right? But if Michigan falls, if they lose, why are they the next team in? They didn't win their conference. They lost when it mattered most. I think they get dropped out and OSU bumps in. And if they don't, Bama does. Dude, after that game, I don't care. Like I, I know. I, yeah, I, I agree. I just with think you. that's head the way it's going to go. Head to head matters. Conference championships oh, matter. Man. Uh, um, oh, Ohio State. Right. Something on them. I don't know how you put Ohio State in. Are you I hear you. I hear you. OSU's yeah. only at five. I think the top four stays this way. I think this is what we get in the playoffs. Maybe USC jumps TCU if they look better in their last game. USC oh, better freaking do. pray yeah. they do. They better pray. I'm so mad. Oh I don't God. even think they. I don't think this USC t- USC team beats Michigan either, though. No. So um, that that's just me. When, but and Georgia's playing LSU, right? So Alabama's yes. not even in the conference championship. So I right. doubt that Alabama would get in. It would have to have a crazy amount of things happen. But I know. I think Mark. I think you're right. If TCU loses, OSU slides in. No problem. Let's talk about some conference championship games, boys. What do you say? You mm. ready? All mm. right. Let's start with the Pac-12. Utah. Against USC, that game is in Vegas. Where's that game at? Is that game in Vegas? I, or maybe is it's there? in San Francisco. I am not sure. Um, great podcasting, by the way. It is in Vegas. Shout out to Mason. Number 11, Utah against number four, USC. That game is at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, Nevada on Saturday I'm trying to get the spread in front of me right so now. So on the Pick'em page, it is USC by two and a half. USC by two and a half. Oh, boys. I pray to God it's Utah, but I don't think it is. I think I think it's USC. I don't know if Utah can score with them. I just don't. At only two and a half, Caleb, the fight in Caleb Williams get it done. Yeah. I think so, too, but... The Cameron Rising, Utah quarterback's a gamer. And all year he's been, you know, all year everyone, the hype's all about Caleb Williams. That would piss me off if I was him, just like it pissed off J.J. McCarthy with um, C.J. Stroud. Um, I don't know. Yeah, USC's going to win this one, but could be close. Oregon. When they first played, yeah, yep. sorry. 
first when they first played Utah won 43 42 uh, Utah went for a two-point conversion I just don't know how you beat a team twice in the same season it's going to be uh probably USC Caleb Williams too much it's uh may help that it's at a neutral site that's that's all I'm saying the the neutral side play does play a factor uh, I mean these are you know conference championship games so they're going to be LSU Georgia the game is in Atlanta like Mark said pretty much a home game for the dogs that's the oh by the way that uh that USC game I think is on Friday pretty sure it's on Friday yep it's it on Friday. Friday Friday at seven o'clock sorry for those of you who needed to know Georgia LSU game is at three o'clock or two o'clock central on Saturday. LSU is going to roll out to this. I don't want, this is not going to be just a Georgia centric. No. Uh, well, yeah, LSU stadium. fans roll LSU out. LSU fans will roll yeah. out and, and they live in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. You're right. Um, I that have said, the spread got, at, I have the spread it. at 17 and a half. Oh, the one on our pick is 16 and a half. And Thank you. Give me, give me that for Georgia all day. Yeah. I, I have Georgia to cover that as well. I think, I think Kirby smart and the dogs smell blood in the water and they don't, they don't show up to that, to the sec championship ready to lose or ready to phone it in. They, they do not look ahead. One thing about Kirby smart teams, they do not look ahead. They are there to win the game that they're in right now. And this LSU team, if that same LSU team that showed up to college station last week shows up to Atlanta on Saturday, they're going to lose by 30. So give me the dogs minus 17 and a half or minus 16 and a half. Is that what it is, Mark? Mm-hmm. Minus 16 and a half. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point about them going into AM last week and shitting the bed. Um, that's a lot of points, though. LSU has nothing to lose. I see them just going lights out and covering, but not winning. Yeah, I think LSU was looking ahead last week and uh, they forgot that they still had to play. Texas A&M and really got the, the you know, out of them. Yeah. So uh, I think Georgia does the same. They are a much better football team. They come prepared, like you said, Mason, Kirby Smart. I'll take the points in Georgia easy. Georgia's allowed 14 points, 6, 19, 13, and 20 in the last five weeks. This, this LSU team ain't scoring more than 25 points. And Georgia's probably going to score 35 or more. So I do have Georgia to cover, though. I know that math doesn't add up, but Georgia's going to cover. Yeah, I was like, so, that, yeah, that's all I know. Me. <laughs> I know. The, the math doesn't add up, but that's uh, what it is. All right, the Big 12 game. What do you say, boys? Kansas State, my fiance's dad's Kansas State Wildcats. He's a, he's an emo. I, Mark and brothers. Brunkart. And brothers. Shout out to Matt Brunkart. Shout out to Matt Burke. I'm trying to get the spread in front of me again. God. Yeah, so we've podcasting. got Troy minus six and a half. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong <laughs> Troy, uh, Troy. I'm looking at Troy right here because I'm on the wrong part. Uh, TCU minus two and a half in Dallas against the Kansas State Wildcats. I think two and a half is not a big enough spread. I think this thing should be closer to like six uh, than to three. So give me TCU to cover that. Are we sure K-State is actually good? Do we know no. who their best quarterback is? Like, no. yeah, they beat us, but well, I'm not even sure they should have beat us. So yeah, well, Howard teams. might be, but Adrian Martinez sort of is. Like, it's weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, give me TCU, Max Duggan, Quentin Jefferson, Johnson, Johnston, whatever his – I swear his name changes every week. I don't Johnston. It. It Johnston definitely does. And Kendra Miller. Get the job done against uh, the K State Wildcats. TCU to cover. TCU to win. TCU minus two and a half. They don't. They don't look ahead. They, like I said, you can't get to the playoff if you don't win this week. And I think they know that. So, I think they'll be locked in. I think they'll be ready to go. TCU wins the game. So the first game they played. TCU had to come back from a 17-point deficit in the second half to beat Kansas State. And Kansas State, that just doesn't happen that often. They play really fundamental defense. They don't turn the ball over. I think this is 
was probably the only upset of the week for me in my eyes or the potential for a team to lose. So I'm going to take Kansas State. I think Will Howard stepping in for Adrian Martinez has played phenomenal. I wish OU had a good backup quarterback like these other teams, but I think Will Howard, Deuce Vaughn, and those guys, I think they're going to pull the only upset of the week in the Big 12 championship. I'll take Kansas State. I I don't think there's like – there's no way TCU doesn't win this game. But at the beginning of the season, if you told me TCU was going 12-0, and 0, I'd say no way either. I think TCU – I agree with Gann. I think TCU could mess this up. There's no way they go 12-0. Let's see what happens. Okay. The last one, ACC Championship. Both these teams coming off a loss coming in in this game. North Carolina against Clemson. Clemson lost by one to South Carolina last week. And then North Carolina lost in double overtime by three to NC State. They're playing for a conference title and pretty much nothing else. So, well, birth in the Orange Bowl, I guess. I guess that's somewhat important. So, I guess give me Clemson. I don't know. It's gross, and I don't like it. But give me – oh, sorry, the spread. Seven and a half is what I have, Mark. Is that what yeah. it is? is yep. I'm page. Seven and a half. Yep. Clemson. Clemson favored by seven and a half Clemson uh, favored. over Carolina. Give me Carolina to cover seven and a half. Is it just me, or did Shane Beamer break Clemson last week? He might have. Might have, right? Spencer Rattler might have Dabo around his neck. That might be a trophy for him now. So let's see how things look this week. I think that UNC is still talented, even though they've lost two straight games, one to Georgia Tech two weeks ago. Go Jackets. Go Jackets. And have a dangerous guy at quarterback in Drake May. So maybe they get the fast one up on Clemson and they don't even have to win. So I have care. Know. I have Carolina to cover Clemson to win. Also shout out to Shane Beamer. I said at the beginning of the year, I really, really like what Shane Beamer's doing. That's back to back top 10 wins for Shane Beaver Beamer and the mighty fighting Gamecocks. Patrick. I think Clemson covers this. I think they're going to end their season with a, with a good win here. Um, I also think next year they are going to be back in the playoffs. I think they get rid of DJ and start Cade moving forward. Because that kid, Klub, Klub, like, Klubnik kid, is a real Klub, Klubnik. Klub, Klubnik, yeah. Matt? Yeah, I don't see Dabo losing two in a row, especially the games that UNC has played the last few weeks. I know we were talking, or we haven't talked about, but the people – the big talking heads are talking about Drake may potentially being a Heisman candidate. He's just kind of fallen off the last few weeks. I think Dabo will have his team prepared. I don't see him losing two. I think Clemson takes it and covers. Okay. Let's circle the wagons. Matt Gann. Get, get us a, get us a circle in and shout out to the men's basketball team. That's called a segue to get you started to circle those wagons. Go ahead. I appreciate you. Like we talked about previously, OU basketball lost their home opener to Sam Houston State. And we were just thinking to ourselves, is this really how we're going to start and open up a season against Sam Houston State, the mighty Houston area? You know, we're really where Mark is close to. But they've come out and they've won six straight, including this past weekend. They were at the ESPN Invitational, which is kind of those mini tournaments where they bring in some teams to play from other conferences. So OU basketball goes in here. First game plays Nebraska, beats them 69 to 56, comes back the next day to beat Satan Hall 77 to 64, and then comes to play Old Miss in the championship game, ends up winning 59-55. Was pretty impressed. I was able to actually watch the championship game, the second half, and OU seemed to be a lot better off than they were last year, especially their transfer guy who I've mentioned before, Grant Sherfield, the transfer averaging 15 points and five assists per game. He was actually named the MVP of the tournament. He is absolutely making a difference. But we do also have some balanced scoring. We had four Sooners in double digit scoring for the championship game so you'd like to see the ball be moving and people getting involved in the game and not just the uh the point guard grant Sherfield. so really good start 
or I should say, bounce back from that first loss. Congratulations to the uh, OU men's basketball team for winning the ASPN Invitational. They actually take on Villanova this Saturday. Villanova's always been kind of a big face in the basketball world, but I think they're like three and five currently, so maybe not the old Villanova that we're used to seeing. Moving on to OU women's basketball. Yeah, go ahead. It's Seton Hall, not Satan Hall. Why would they? It's a little mispronunciation. You're okay, man. That's a no. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. I just I think you did it on they purpose. Call it we Satan hate those Hall. guys. <laughs> we did it on purpose. We hate those guys. Mark, let me know if you want to take over the segment. All right. <laughs> no, I think you're doing excellent. I think all of this is perfect. I just one quick thing, man. Yeah, I thought you were gonna. Add something like informational, like, hey, did you hear about this one guy on the team? And yeah, no, okay. Well, it's I not- it. Always appreciate you keeping not just being a hater, check, Mark. So, yeah, I appreciate you, Mark. Always looking after me. On to OU women's basketball, suffering, I believe, one of their worst losses uh, about a week ago to Utah. They lost 124 to 78. Boys, that's a pretty wide margin of a loss. But they did bounce back. They beat UT Arlington 89-80 and just beat Arkansas State 95-70. So a good bounce back for the Lady Sooners. They end up playing, or they will play, Northwestern State actually tonight. So we'll know uh, what the score is for tomorrow. Currently 5-1, and one, so not bad. But you just hate to see that, uh, that wide <laughs> error of a loss. Uh, but... Hopefully they continue to play on as the season progresses. The only other sport that really just needs to be talked about was OU women's volleyball. Their season just ended not too long ago. They ended the season 15 and 13, but they were 5 and 11 in conference play. So not really a good showing from them. They did have some all 12 big honors with Megan Wilson and Morgan Perkins. So you do see, or you do like seeing some of those ladies Sooners getting some of those awards, especially after a a very long season that they had the last two games, they lost to Iowa state three to one and got swept by TCU three to O. So hopefully they can come back next year, but their season has recently ended and those three programs are the only ones going on. So that has circled the wagons. What I got for you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Matt. We're back to circle the wagon season, folks. Football season mm. coming to an end. So Matt's Matt's segment is going to be a major key in the future coming months. Patrick, Before two we minutes. Transition, yeah. Jaden Hazelwood to the NFL just popped up. Hey, Jaden. Good right. for you, man. Good for you, Jaden. Congrats. Yeah, congrats to Jaden. Always like that guy. All right, Patrick, two minutes of World Cup. Massive win. I'm wearing my hat today. Yep. It's got fishes on it, but it's a USA flag nonetheless. U.S. moving on to the round of 16. Patrick, it's your, two exciting. Minutes, your two minutes starts now. All right. Currently, there are six teams moving on to the next round. Next round will be single elimination. England, USA, the Dutch, Senegal, Brazil, Portugal, and France are those six teams. Qatar, the host nation, was the first team eliminated from the World Cup. You'll love Good. to see it. Before today, the Spanish had scored the most goals uh, with with uh, set because they won seven zero. Um, England have eight goals now, but they've played an extra game. Spain scores a lot of goals. That's the point of that. Mbappe has the most goals out of anyone in the World Cup currently at three. He will probably win the Golden Boot Award and score the most goals in this World Cup. Argentina, kind of a little bit in trouble, potentially. Uh, they need to at least tie Poland for Messi to stay in the World Cup. But if Saudi Arabia beats uh, Mexico, then Argentina actually need a win against Poland. It'll be tough for Argentina to win against Poland. They haven't had a great World Cup this far, even though they have been one of the favorites, like every single Fox Sports person who doesn't know soccer. Um, anyways, Argentina or uh, Saudi Arabia beat Argentina in the first game. That was a big upset. Saudi Arabia has nine of their 11 starters start on the same team. So there's just consistency there that no one else has. Uh, Germany needs to beat Costa Rica. This is also a large shock. Germany be, needs to beat Costa Rica to stay in the World Cup and also needs Spain to either tie or beat Japan. Uh, there will be three female referees in Germany against Costa Rica. It is the first time ever in a World Cup that three female referees will be refing a single game together. Brazil, Neymar got hurt for Brazil, so that's tough for them. Um, Neymar might be out for the entire World Cup. Brazil, in my opinion, isn't as good as what people are hyping them up to be, but they're still good and they still have good players. Lastly, I'll just do my power rankings and then we can talk about the, yeah. the US if you want. France, England, Spain, Brazil, Germany are my power rankings. Love it. 
Did I go over time? No, 150. But uh, I do want to talk about U.S. today. U.S. beat Iran 1-0. 1-0. Apologies. Beat them 1-0 today to move on to the round of 16. That's super exciting. I remember the last time that USA was in the round of 16, I was the rush chair for Delta Tau Delta. And I watched the game, the round of 16 game with Ethan York, Ethan Trisa, and Field Derby in uh, our cottage in Norman while we were rushing kids. So that was, that's pretty funny yeah. to, to reminisce that cool. on that and, and think about that. But that, that was the last time USA was in the round of 16. Patrick, do we know who they're going to play yet? Or are we still waiting on the group play to finish up? Again, do we know? Sure. Yeah, they're playing Holland. Right. The Netherlands. Yeah, the right. Netherlands. Netherlands. They're like plus 3E75, I think. Uh, yeah, they're last playing. I checked. And it should be Saturday, right? That's what, that's what Christian Pulisic said. Yeah. No, that's not bad odds. That's not yep. bad odds. You might, you might catch me dropping a little capital. Yeah, okay. I think the U.S. has a good chance of winning this. Honestly, yeah. I do. Really? You think mm-hmm. so? Yeah, the Dutch just aren't impressive to me, and the U.S. have been doing everything that they needed to do in each game. I don't always agree with the decision-making, the strategy, or the starting lineup. <laughs> that will eventually fault Berhalter, but the guys that are have been in there have been doing their best and really playing playing strong. So They were freaking exhausted after the game today. They were they collapsed on that yeah. field. Nine minutes of stoppage time, too, to end the game after five minutes before the half. That's freaking nuts, man. Yeah, it's that's rough. so much. It's just crazy. Matt, what would you see out of the out of the Americans? Mighty fighting Cap- Americans. Captain America had to make a statement today that was Christian Pulisic put his body on the line to get that goal. Is an incredible cross from the mil- midfield to Sergio Des, who made an absolutely brilliant run to get get the header across. I'm really worried about two major injuries. Um, Sergeant, our forward, I thought I played really well today, holding up the ball, collecting it, taking alleviating pressure, and obviously the major one uh, being Christian Polistic. Will he be able to play on Saturday? That's going to make a huge difference if he's not able to play uh, against the Netherlands. So we'll he says to, he is. We'll have yeah. to see, but he's got that oblique injury, and I'm sure that can't be can't feel comfortable to ride around for 90 minutes and get bumped and all that. So we'll they just say, see. Hopefully he does play. They say it's a rib, but it looks like he got hit in the penis. Like, yeah, res- respectfully. Respectfully. Yeah. I saw people. Like- I saw people on Twitter saying, "Christian, you can have my dick." <laughs> yeah. I saw that as well, Patrick. I just want you to admit that you picked Iran. Oh, I did. Hey, you better watch out. Iranian and, journalists are going to come attack you if you keep saying it wrong like that. Yeah. Don't yeah. say Iran. Yeah. Iran. Sorry. That's all. Um, that's yeah, all I me. did again. I did. And you know what? Uh, they were pretty close to tying today. Pretty close. So I think that wasn't as hot of a take as people thought it was. Well, but I, was the, I was wrong. I was wrong. Just also admit that the U.S. has the best midfield in the World Cup. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> name, not. Name Tyler Adams better. has been playing fantastic. Tyler Musa Adams is, is shaky. Pat, if the Germans don't make the round of 16, where is your headspace going to be at? I it's full depression. Um, okay. I don't know. If Could you live stream it? Week. I don't know if that's live streamable. We'll see. Actually, like, maybe. On the program, guys. I, I really think. That's a good idea. I, I think should. the I think the the next German game should be at least the second half a live stream on the on the program guys. Instagram. I will live stream myself watching during it. this. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. Be be on the lookout for that. All right, boys. What do you say we get to some MVP time? Sound mm. good? Mm. All right. Our PGP MVP of the week. Be sure to like. Uh, be sure to comment down below while you're watching along with us. If you made it this far, let us know who your MVP of the week is. We love hearing that as well. And maybe you can be our commenter of the week next week. We'll read your MVP by the time we get to ours. I'll start. My MVP of the week is Teron Armstead for the Miami Dolphins. He's their left tackle. He got injured in the game on Sunday, and immediately after he was injured, Tua got sacked like three times on the left side of the line where Teron. Armstead is usually playing. He is crucial for the Miami Dolphins success and crucial for the success of Tua Tungavailoa, almost as much so as Tyreek Hill is. So Teron Armstead is my MVP. He shows how important he is to this team. He sustained a pectoral injury. He's not out for the year, but he's going to be out for a couple weeks, which is tough for the Dolphins with a couple of crucial games coming up at the at the 49ers, at the Chargers. Um Big, big stretch for the Dolphins coming up. So, Toronto, I'm said, get well soon. My MVP of the week. Bam. I'll go Amazing. next. Okay. I talked about it in the Circle the Wagon segment. I'll give it to OU Basketball, but more specifically, the transfer, Grant Shurfield, who averaged 
15 points and about five and a half assists during that streak. That's why he got MVP and led the Sooners to a uh, three sweep in that uh, invitational. Got to give it to OU men's basketball, Grant Shurfield. Love it. Patrick. I have Keisher Fuller. He's the right midfielder for Costa Rica that uh, uh, one got the scoring goal against Japan. He is the reason why Germany still has hope in this World Cup. Love it. Mark, finish this out. Yeah, give me Brent Key. He is the new head coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. He was the interim head coach taking over for Jeff Collins early in the season and guided the Yellow Jackets to a 4-4 four and four record within one game of bowl eligibility, something they never achieved during the entire Collins era before him. You know, a lot of work ahead, but this guy's an alum. He's worked under Nick Saban. They really love him there. And... Uh, uh, obviously was able to turn it into a full-time gig. So Brent Key, my MVP. Amazing. Let us know down below in the comments who your MVP of the week is. And guys, that's going to be a wrap. Episode 41 is in the books. As always, be sure to like, subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Twitter, Program Guys with a Z, Instagram, Program Guys with a Z. However you get your podcast, that's where you can find us. Our Facebook page, uh, Program Guys Podcast as well. We appreciate you, as always, for watching. Let us know down in the comments as well while you're watching this what you want to see in the offseason. We're always looking for new ideas, maybe some, some new segments, maybe some new topics to cover, NBA, NFL. Anything is up is up for debate right now. Just put it in the comments. We, we... Whoops. Whoops. You're good. Whoops. I about unplugged my mic, and that's going to do it for this week's episode. Patrick, take us out. Keep pushing it, baby.